Well, here we go. Well, welcome. Good morning. How are we doing on this fine Tuesday? What's that? My alarm went off late. Your alarm went off late. Okay. And that totally threw you off altogether? All right. Okay, I understand. Anyone else? The thunder? Yeah. Briefly, briefly, I heard I heard the thunder and um I think my family members wanted me to you know, kind of do some like go around and check stuff. Was not happening. Was not happening. You know, and my wife I always like it when my wife says, you know, you know, I try to tell you to do this and I'm like, You're trying to have a conversation with me when I'm sleeping? I'm not gonna remember anything. But I will be held accountable for everything that has been said. Like, yeah. So the house is fine. Water, nothing, no damage, none of that. We I think we're still I think our first year that we moved into our house, um, there was a wicked Memorial Day storm that zipped through where um, uh, the winds were extremely strong to knock down trees and rip off siding and stuff. And our neighbor's trampoline flew into the side of our house. So I think that trauma is still there. Whenever there's a storm, it's like, make sure you check everything. And it's like, there's no trampolines in the neighborhood. There's none of that stuff. Don't worry about it. We'll be fine. And that's why we have insurance. Bottom line, that's why you have insurance. If something happens, all that. No, but I, I, I totally get you know, being off today in that um, I couldn't figure out where I put my wallet. It's like, okay, I'm notorious, you know, where I'll, I'll have a routine where I put stuff. And then when you get off the routine, um, then it's like, okay, where is it? It's not in my bag. It's not in my usual drawer. But maybe it's at school. Maybe it's at school. And then I realized halfway here, uh, it's in the other car. So I drove all the way back home for that. So I found my wallet. Find the wallet. You do not realize, I guess you the importance of your wallet or some things like that, keys or whatever, until you, you misplace them. And then you start panicking. All that. All that. All right. So here we go. All right, so um, with the, the authoritarian case studies, give me a, a few days here. Uh, some of them are a little long, and so it'll take me some time to get through them, but I, I'm very optimistic that you did a fantastic job on them. So we will slug away with them, and hopefully by Thursday or Friday, I'll have all that stuff uh, graded. Your course grade is updated, okay? Today, we'll move on to our last, our last unit of study for 20th century world history, and it'll be on the Cold War. So this will take us uh, to the end. And that little, that little image that I have there um, looks like uh, chocolate bars being parachuted down. Uh, when we look at um, how we, in some ways, try to influence uh, or show goodwill, it was during the Berlin uh, blockade that uh, an American pilot uh, would parachute down to the children of West Berlin uh, chocolate bars. And he would get the nickname the Chocolato Uncle, or the Chocolate Uncle. Um, and uh, it really won over uh, the West Berliners, the children, and uh, now we're talking about lifelong uh, allies in many ways because of that, just to that little gesture, the chocolate, all that. All right, but uh, we will take a look at the Cold War in its totality from the beginning to its end and all the elements that go along with it and the, and the, the high drama that is associated with uh, the Cold War, okay? And then, uh, 
we'll start a, an activity called uh, Cold War Steps. We'll look at the foundation. Those first uh, five to 10 years of the Cold War kind of sets the tone and the nature of how this uh, ideological war is going to play out. Okay. Any thoughts or questions before we, we, we move forward here? All right. So I, I've got a few notes I'm going to share, and I have a copy of these in Schoology. Um, they're called the Cold War. And so I really want to focus on the nature of the Cold War. You know, kind of brainstorm here. What do we know about this Cold War? What are some things that come to your mind about the Cold War? Whether here or at home, some things that we know about the Cold War. The one that always like, comes to mind, the we will bury you. We will bury you. Yes. Um, so the rhetoric, the words, phrases that come out, absolutely. There are plenty of them. You know, and some of them become iconic and when you literally translate them they mean different things than what is being said like ich bin ein berliner all right uh, kennedy's trying to say you know I, i'm a berliner but realistically you know he's uh, a berliner is uh is a, is a pastry but um everyone understood exactly what he's getting at though or uh, about the Cold War. Not that you have lived through it. You're in the post-Cold War. However, there are there is talk that we are in a new Cold War, in a Cold War with China, in terms of uh, military influence in uh, certain parts of the world, specifically like the South China Seas, or the East China Seas, um, economic, uh, Cold War as well is trying to have influence in various regions around the world, Latin America and Africa. Uh, and even during COVID, uh, vaccine diplomacy between uh, China and uh, West, the Western world as well, using vaccine to try to get some inroads into uh, those countries. All right, but here we go. The Cold War, uh, John Mason, a historian, he kind of summarizes the Cold War up in this way. The Cold War was a period of intense antagonism between the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, lasting from 1945 to 1991, because there was no direct armed conflict between the two continental giants. The description in Cold War remains an accurate one. Now that it's over, we, not, we know the outcome. It is tempting to redefine this period of recent history as the long peace, right? Now, John Mason is, we will call him a post-revisionist historian. So uh, he is uh, looking at this from the lens uh, that there are multiple uh, participants that contribute to this Cold War and how it plays out. But realistically, um, he brings up some points, but he also uh, also raises some more complicated issues. Is it really a period of long peace? Really a period of long peace. His head's going this way. Why wouldn't we say it's a period of long peace? All right, because there's wars and conflicts. So those people living in those areas where those wars are happening, you know, so if you're going to uh, uh, Asia, uh, there's going to be some conflicts. Vietnam, they're going to say, oh, that's not peace. Or in Africa, you know, you, you're looking at all these different wars that, that pop up after World War II. We'll call them proxy wars. All right. So, yeah, long peace may not be accurate. Uh, you know, in terms of the dates, this is usually what we tend to think about the, the dates, 1945, 1991. But um, we know that those are a little gray and they can, 
they can extend a little bit earlier and perhaps even continue a little bit later after 1991, all that. And the meaning of superpower itself, you know, is a complicated one. That what goes into be calling a superpower. But there we go. So after World War II, we got some concerns here between these two superpowers. And um, what, what is at the heart of the concerns? We know at the end of World War II, or as, or as we're getting near the end of World War II, during those wartime peace conferences, or those wartime conferences, there are ideological differences out there. We have a common enemy, but ideologically, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, we're not all on the same page. Uh, there is dislike personally and uh, ideologically, there are some differences, dislikes. So for the Soviet Union, their concerns after World War II usually revolve around economic justice. This idea of uh, being able to create your own economic system that is going to look out for the worker's interests. All right, again, we can put quotes on that, uh, air quotes around that. Security on their Western border, you know, they've been attacked numerous times on the Western border. They want security there. They simply want it. And Eastern Europe is a perfect security blanket for them. Balance of military power, they're concerned about the size of the United States, military power in Western democracies as well. And they want to make sure that there's balance of military power. And then they're also keenly aware of what, what's going on, have gone on in the Pacific too. So there's potential threats on both sides. And then the atomic blackmail. The United States would say, hey, we'll share the atomic secrets with us, with you. But you got to open up. You got to open up. You got to show us your books. You got to take care of people a little bit better. And the Soviets, you know, they were like, that's, that's pretty um, ironic that you say you got to take care of people better. Because this, after all, is the era of Jim Crow in the United States. The United States, at the same time, you know, for our concerns is the restructuring of former Axis powers. We want them to be more democratic. Let free elections happen. Soviets may not let that happen. Free access to resources and markets. All right, after all, our number one foreign policy uh, and motive is trade. Then, and still is, it seems like trade. Price of government, yeah. we let the, let's say, let the people decide. And there are plenty of governments that have fled when access power is moving in, they're coming back and they want to be able to have a say, like free Poland. Atomic forces for peace. Um, we look at the atomic weapon now as a means to ensure peace. And throughout the Cold War, it will become a very important symbol. And limited territorial changes, because we know that once a country goes communist, uh, it's hard to get it to go back. And so we do not want to see the redrawing of the map too much. That's our theories. That's our ideas. Okay. So it is a clash of ideologies. We know that it will be. Uh, we're on a crusade for freedom. Uh, we'll actually come up with uh, ways to get our message out there, like Radio Free Europe, all that. But capitalism is seems to be um, a part of this class of idea, clash of ideologies. I mean, we've got individualism, we have uh, the idea of democracy, but also capitalism here. A market economy and individual political rights would secure a good living standard for all. That's our thought, that's our belief, right? And it's one that you know we kind of maintain and we still, even today we talk about capitalism and how it influences the standard of living. And when tweaks to capitalism happens, there's usually some pushback, right? Depending on types of programs and stuff. Contain and roll back communism for world peace, all right? In the Cold War, we talk about containment, keep it where it is, but at times we talk about rolling it back as well. Like in Korea, 
There was a moment where we thought, could we roll it back? That was a brief moment. And then entered the Chinese forces, and that changed things. The reality check, though, if we want to do a reality check, um, capitalism seemed to work best in nations that would already fit in the category as a developed nation where the systems are already there and the standard of living has already been um, increasing. But in the case of the developing world, right, sometimes in my day, we called them the third world nations. Those that are just emerging. They don't have all the system in place. Capitalist market, free market system, didn't seem to work well and may not have extended and poverty and inequality, need for education and health care, all that stuff was there. And they tended to look like they're going to turn in a different direction. This is also, we see the emergence of authoritarian regimes in some of these places as well. So reality check, capitalism was only working well in the developed world. And so the communists knew that perhaps they could find some inroads here. For communists, they looked at capitalist competition, led to periodic economic crisis and wars. Lenin would always like to point, and Trotsky would like to point to the First World War as a good example. And then uh, the Second World War. And the reasons that countries are going to where they are was for resources. So they look at capitalist competition as, as something to uh, avoid. Communist revolutions, they felt, were the only hope for peace and good standard of li living. Because the theories that went with it, you know, and we looked at them. Reality check, though. The type of communism that Stalin comes up with, they definitely um, had their own form. He had his own form of communism, Marxist-Leninism, and that it really wasn't, communism really wasn't a government led by the workers or the proletariat, but it was led by a party and a small group of people. that did not necessarily look out for the working class or the workers' needs, all right? And also, when we look at it, the Soviet Union simply ignored perhaps some of the accomplishments of the West, okay? So we have a clash of ideologies, but what can also add a little bit more to it, some of these dynamic people, some of these personalities, and we know some of them. In the United States, every four years, we have a change of a new president. So the changing U.S. presidents can bring on a different direction or can add some more drama to it. You know, for us during the Cold War, our presidents, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson. You know, I always get a little starry-eyed when Johnson appears on there. That's, that, that's when I know that it, uh, he's my first president uh, when, I, when I'm born. Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and Bush. Sometimes we think the Cold War ends with Reagan, but it actually ends with George Herbert Walker Bush. It's on his watch that the Cold War comes to an end. Each of those presidents may come from a different party. All right, They may come from different parties. Some of them on there are Democrats. Some of them are Republicans. They may have different agendas. And they, they all have interesting personalities. Some are more dynamic than others in that list. But they also have Secretary of States. And sometimes we think, big whoop, who cares about Secretary of States? Well, that's our chief diplomat. And they could be hardliners. And they can influence the President of the United States in policy. So some of those Secretary of States will have some big influences there. People like um, Kissinger and um, uh, Oscar uh, Dulles, 
could have uh, strong influences. And then for the Soviet Union, uh, very complex Soviet leaders. Uh, you're a Soviet leader typically until you die, it seems like. Uh, there's one on the list, though, that kind of, or a couple of them on the list that kind of throw that off. You got Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernenko, and Gorbachev. Sometimes in the West they call him Gorby. But Khrushchev, he gets removed. He gets removed. So he doesn't die in office like the others. Uh, Gorbachev, well, he, he, he's the last one standing you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed. But all these individuals either, you know, have a hard line approach to the West except Gorbachev. Uh, some of them look out for the party itself. Some of them look out for uh, special interests. Some struggle to figure out, do they expand the Soviet Union's influence beyond Europe? How far? What is worth fighting for and not? Um, ultimately, uh, the price tag of, the, uh, of this Cold War is going to impact uh, quality of life at home. That's going to play a problem for uh, some of these leaders like on drop off or Brezhnev on drop off Chernenko and Gorbachev. There's going to be some issues, some internal things that are going to happen. But of course, some emerging regional leaders, some of them that look at the United States and the Soviet Union and say, hey, that's your, that's your problem. It's not my problem. They got their own agenda. You know, Mao, he's going to want to march to his own beat. Fidel Castro, same thing, with a cigar in his mouth. Kamal Nasser, same thing. He is going to be leader in the Arab world. All of them are going to try to find a way to play off the Soviets of the United States. Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia, um, one of the rare ones that could stand up to Stalin and live to tell about it. But he did. So you are going to have some leaders that are going to try to, during this war, stand up to the superpowers and have some success in doing it. Now, how does it play off? And now I'm going to take it home here. How does it play out? Where does this play out? Well, we know at times we'll have proxy wars. Simple, we will. But in those proxy wars, um, it United States or the Soviet Union may not directly fight each other, but um, indirectly through someone else. Besides those proxy wars, it's going to play out in the UN. You got your United States camp and you got your Soviet camp, and because the UN becomes divided, it cannot live up to its full potential. The United Nations especially with that Security Council where either the United States and the Soviet Union can veto whatever they want to do, it handcuffs the United Nations. Now, by the 1960s, though, there is some nations in the UN that are saying enough is enough. We're sick and tired of this drama, and they try to create a non-alignment movement. Now, still really in existence today where they want to march their own beat. Yes, we would like to work with you, but not with the strings attached. And so that's where these regional leaders will play out. So you have that. Of course, aid, military and economic aid can help out. And some of our policies will focus on that, like the new look. May not send in a lot of troops, but we're going to send in some dollars or covert operations. Culture and sporting competitions, of course, it's going to play out there. Both need to be the best. Even if it is a chess match, we need to be the best. And when American finally beats the Soviet in chess, it is huge. And in the arts, of course, you know, and in the music and in, in, the, in, in, in the literature and all that, it plays out in it. And, of course, the arms and the space race plays out there. When Sputnik happened, that was a technological Pearl Harbor. 
They called it a technological Pearl Harbor. How in the heck can the Soviets did that? They must have had the better Nazi scientists than us. So then, so now we're going to go, okay, fine. You got, you got Sputnik up there. Fine. We're going to go to the moon. Space race to be the first. Because the fear was, you know, if they can get a satellite up there, who knows? They could probably put something in space that's going to knock us out in the CG. Uh, the arms race. Yeah. You know, you got the atomic bomb, but by uh, the early fifties, you got the hydrogen bomb. And then it's like, oh, we gotta, we gotta have the ICBMs. Oh, we gotta have the SLBMs. Oh, we've gotta have the anti-ballistic missiles now. No, nope, we gotta have some MERVs. Oh, we gotta create Star Wars. Space race, arms race. Arms race becomes deterrent, right? And spies and lies, of course, the name of the game, spies and lies, spying on each other. And of course, spreading lies through propaganda, the, the, the need to do well, spread it through propaganda, spies and lies. And at times we capture their spy and they capture ours and we got to trade them. Got to trade them. And then the general public, it plays out in the general public as well. Uh, maybe your neighbor is a communist. Maybe your neighbor's a capitalist in murder. We gotta figure it out. But an atomic Cold War culture is being created here. Who knows, you might buy a house. Someday you might buy a house and you're like, wow, look at this, it has a bomb shelter built. Plays out in the general public. People began to conform. If this was the 1950s, you do everything that you can do to conform to society. What that meant? Well, you might have joined Boy Scout, Girl Scouts. You might have gone to church regularly. You might have joined some of those those community clubs. Like you go off to college. You might want to join some of those conformity uh, organizations like fraternities and sororities and stuff like that. It plays out in the general public. And depending on the events, it comes out. It comes out. All that good stuff. You know, my mom always would say, if you want to make someone nervous, just call him a commie. It's like, oh, that's hardcore. That's hardcore, mom. You know, did you learn that from all your, your Catholic upbringing? Sometimes, you know, it felt like a cold war, you know, whenever I make a statement like that to my mom. But there we go. The Cold War comes in stages, though. It comes in stages. We'll have Cold Wars, and then we'll have a Hot War. And a Hot War is usually when we have those proxy wars. And so today we want to really focus on uh, the breakdown of the cooperation and moving towards that first Cold War, where we see some dis disagreements. It's, it's kind of like we're setting the, we're setting the boundaries. We're figuring out who's on whose side. We're throwing out the initial rhetoric out there. All right. And so to do that, let's pop into Schoology to see how this first Cold War phase begins to play out. So let's pop in there. Let's see if I don't know what I want to put. All right. Let's go. And it's going to be called Cold War Steps. And we're going to look at eight, eight uh, steps in this process here. And so this is where rivalry and mistrust is going to uh, come out. And uh, we can definitely say we are in a Cold War. But how long? We don't know at that point. All right. So if you open up the, the activity, it's going to look something like this. Right. And we're going to use chapter uh, the chapters in our textbook two and three for this. OK, this is going to be solo this time. And what we want to do is we want to research and analyze various events that led to the Cold War division. Bottom line, try to get some quick highlights, understanding that this relationship is going to be very tenuous between Harry Truman and Uncle Joe. 
All right, and you're gonna create a visual vocabulary on this here. So we're going, we're going to have it here. All right, and so here's our eight. And some of these um, are known. We may know about them and some of them may not. Wartime conferences, we have three of them here. There you can see in these conferences uh, the, the difference of opinion on what to do with Europe and, and, and why. The Kenan Long, Kenan's Long Telegram may not be viewed as, you know, really sexy in a classy way, but it is an extremely long telegram. Telegrams usually are like a, less than 100 words. Uh, this one's well over 1,000. Uh, goes on and on. It's a ramble, but <clears throat> it's, it's key. It's key to um, United States views about the Soviets. Harry Truman is our president, and he views the world black and white. There's no gray. He would do. He would not do well in IB because it's all gray. All right, for Harry Truman, give him hell, Harry. Um, it's it's either this or that, and so Kennan's telegram is perfect for Harry Truman. Churchill's Iron Curtain speech. He's no longer Prime Minister of England, so he gets to. Uh, shoot whatever he wants to say. Uh, Truman Doctrine is a big one. Marshall Plan. You have the Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe, Czech coup, and the Berlin blockade. The wall is not going up with the Berlin blockade here in 1948-49. Uh, wall goes up in 1961. All right, so again, look for, so we want to use our textbook. We do not want to GTS this. Go straight to our textbook. Find a quote or phrase that explains the topic. And usually um, there will be plenty of that there. And then two or three bullet points in your words to help you explain it further. What the long telegram is going to be. All right. And visual. Keep it simple. Hand drawn is preferred here. Um, you can do this on paper. And I have it. I have paper in the back room if you want to do it on paper and you just Take a snapshot of it. You can do that. That's fine. Or you can do it in on any of these platforms as well. All right. And of course, we got the BHQs that you need to. There's two of them here. Discuss who you consider to be the most responsible for the growth of the hostility between East and West, Soviet Union or the United States here. That's historiography being done. And to what extent was ideology the main factor? Could have been something else than ideology as the main factor here. Could have been something else. All right. So it's a two-dayer. Um, if you are doing it on paper, I'll collect it from you uh, by Thursday. All right. But it's a two-dayer, and uh, we just are looking for the foundations here. All right. Questions, comments, concerns? I will cut you loose so you can work on this. Those at home, if you have any questions or concerns, you can stay on or exit.